we're back. Episode 19 of Radio A Spoil. You're very welcome. As always, uh, wherever you see this podcast and video cast, like, subscribe, share, follow, whatever is appropriate. Uh, I really do appreciate it. It helps. I don't monetize what I'm doing here. Um, we have a guest tonight. And he's John Buckley McQuaid, an Irish musician. We're going to talk about an awful lot of subjects here. Irish culture. Mary Magdalene Laundries. Politics. We're going to cover an awful lot of subjects. Some of them will be difficult. I hope you appreciate that. But straight away, I want to go into John's... Uh, profile and biography he was born in Dublin he's based in Denmark for many many years he's a professional musician who has toured all over Europe from pub and music venues to art museums theatres, schools, prisons and festivals in addition to writing songs he writes lyrics and fairy tales he is also a visual artist, and that's photography, painting, and illustration, and makes videos and short films. He played his first paid gig at the Fox Rock Folk Club in Dublin, Ireland, in 1969. He bussed and played around Dublin until 1972, when he left for London. He moved to Denmark in '73 where he turned profe- uh, uh, as a professional musician in 79. Much of his writing contains social commentary, challenging the prevalent general apathy. His albums over the years include Recorded Pain 1979, Stations in the Sky 1985, and Call It Love 1990. In 2017, he released Valentine's Day, which was a 29 video and song ebook. He'll actually mention this in the interview we're going to hear with him. His sixth album, This Is Where I Keep My Dreams, was released in 2021. It's a collection of 12 original songs about Ireland addressing such issues as the Magdalene Laundries, the Vulture Funds and the general Irish diaspora throughout the world. Often dealing with aspects of Ireland and its uncomfortable past. His latest single, Homeless Hotels, was released on the 31st of January this year and is dedicated to the homeless and victims of abuse everywhere and Ireland in particular. Now just a brief, I've wanted to do an episode on music. Not necessarily Ireland but it just so happens this one is going to be about Ireland because I think it's appropriate. But I've wanted to do an episode about music and artists. As you know, I've I've done an awful lot of episodes on publishing and writing. But I felt John Buckley McQuaid was an appropriate guest. And I hope you will appreciate it. Um there's there's a lot in this interview. There's a lot we're gonna go through. I hope you'll enjoy it and other than I was normally going boom straight to guest I'm very appreciative that John has allowed us to share and given us permission to include some of the tracks from his album This Is Where I Keep My Dreams We're going to take, before we go to talk to John, the opening track, 
and it's called Prodigal Kiss. After that, we'll go straight to John and the interview. There's a crowd of ghosts that haunts O'Connell Street And a spire where the pillar used to be Now the city boasts a mighty tourist fleet While the Liffey's full of longing for the sea I'll meet you at Cleary's, there under the clock We'll drive to Dunleary and go for a walk The chapel's still standing, the convent is not Along with the school where me mother once taught And you can be sure that we'll never forget The culture of vultures and dealers in debt The struggles and troubles, the gold, white and green So much for our beautiful 1916 And here is a place where old memories wait where fates spin their threads by the Leeson Street gate And plants for the blind are all labelled in braille We hadn't a chance, and so how could we fail? Where Beckett and Oscar and Yates had their day And Joyce had to leave to be able to stay Thin Lizzie's filling its back from the Crusades His statue looks at you outside of MacDades and you can be sure that we'll never forget The culture of vultures and dealers in debt The struggles and troubles, the gold, white and green So much for our beautiful 1916 As Oisin returns from the land of his youth His heart is still young, though he's long in the tooth For want of a horse, he'll be taken the Lewis He used to be cool, now he's yesterday's news And where shall he go on this journey of his? And when will he know what isn't and is? What wouldn't he give for the things that he'll miss? A touch or a glimpse? Or a prodigal kiss And you can be sure that we'll never forget The culture of vultures and dealers in debt The struggles and troubles, the gold, white and green So much for our beautiful 1916 and you can be sure that we'll never forget The culture of vultures and dealers in debt The struggles and troubles, the gold, white and green So much for our beautiful 1916 Okay, uh, welcome back to Radio Spoil, and I'm delighted to be joined now by uh, John Buckley McQuaid. You were just listening there to a track from his uh, recent album, and that track was uh, Prodigal Kiss. John, you're very welcome I'm to Radio Spoil. I'm, 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 hello, <laughs> how are you doing? <laughs> John, I went through the uh, the bio for you. Um, you're in Denmark. Yes. Um, I'm in the Netherlands. Yeah. We're both Irish, and we yeah. both don't live in the country of our birth. And some yeah. of those subjects are probably going to come up in the discussion about your album and the uh, the tracks we talk about. But without further ado, let's get straight into it. What do you think? Okay. 
Um, fair enough. You know, um, you're des- you're describing, you know, um, the diaspora uh, as such, you know, um, like more people are still leaving today than are returning. And like, for example, there's a line in the song that says Joyce had to leave to be able to stay. And I think that describes it. They call us expats. Does that bother you? Nobody's ever called me an expat. <laughs> Maybe it's a thing in the Netherlands. No, I don't. I don't think it's. I I, I think it's more to do with ex, you know, patriots, or I I think it's more to do with that. I don't think they mean expats and expaddies or anything like that, as we sometimes oh, used ex- to get called in England. So ex expatriates. That's yeah, what it comes. To. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, let's let's face it. If if when I left Ireland, I left because I wanted to pursue a dream, which I could not realise in Ireland. Now, I won't say it was that. Uh, how can I say organised in my head, like and so focused, but uh, it's what. In the meantime, kind of thinking back on it, uh, that's the way it is. I mean, I could never have lived from playing my own music, my own songs. And just that. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. I've done fine and I'm happy. Um, I'm playing in a country where Danish is the spoken language and nobody really understands what I'm singing about. Well, there are, of course, there are some exceptions that do. And that's fine with me because um, I have a lot of things to say. And it's the, not the kind of music that would be played on the radio. Because I'm touching subjects that people once swept under the carpet. We have centuries of um, the Catholic Church practicing deception, practicing hypocrisy. Uh, I've always wondered, you know, back to the time of 1916, uh, what the people then who had those dreams and fought for those dreams to free Ireland from from the British, from British rule, um, what they'd say to the state of the country now. I imagine what would Oshin have to say if he came back and he looked around and could understand I don't think he'd even understand what was going on. But if he did understand, how many heads would he be cutting off? Prodigal Kiss is one of the tracks on on the album you're speaking about is This Is Where I Keep My Dreams. Yes. The opening line, and I want to talk an awful lot more about Prodigal Kiss. The opening line is, there's a crowd of ghosts the haunts of Connell Street. It's a very powerful opening line. And, and I'll talk about that a little bit more as 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 we listen to some of the tracks on the album. <laughs> um, what haunts you? Yeah. It's very hard to answer that question. Um, Is it a, uh, let me explain. Is it a shared haunting? That would be the best of all possible worlds if it was. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're individualists and there's very, very little solidarity today. Um, Going back to the way things are, um, at the present moment, I think um, there's a certain person who's a TD and he's she's over there in she's delighted to be at the Irish Pavilion in the Expo 2020 of Dubai, building on a strong relationship between two countries, our, our two countries and diaspora. And then she tells uh, what a great destination Ireland is for you, uh, United Arab Emirates visitors. And then 
some musicians played. Now, the thing is, that was all very fine. You refer to it. But the interestingly, thing is this, in Prodigal Kiss, you refer to the mighty tourist fleet, which is yeah. what she's after. Yeah. Now, the thing is this. Uh, when when our culture, which is multifaceted, wonderful, rich, is basically an advertisement to attract investment to the country. Mm -hmm. That's all it's useful for. And um, I know that Mary Coughlin has written where she wrote last year, Minister Catherine Martin announced a financial aid package for arts, music and cultural events that were cancelled be because of Omicron. And she, this week she's in Dubai with an entourage pro promoting Irish music and culture. And not one cent has been paid out to the musicians who complied with the government, who cancelled the gigs. Those gigs are gone. They're never coming again. She had 25 gigs at the time and 10 are going ahead three months later. And her comment is, have a nice holiday in Dubai, Catherine. Because what they're doing is disgusting and totally without respect. They have no respect for our own culture, their culture. We're the first when it comes to selling the country and we're the last that they will help. Um, between Spotify and the attitude of the powers that be, in terms of culture. There's no future. For musicians or for artists. There's not. There's, there's been a great deal. And we, we don't want to get too far away from Prodigal Kiss, but there's been. Yeah, but this, is, this, is, a, this has got a, to do with Prodigal Kiss. Yeah, yeah very much so. But there's been a great deal of discussion in Ireland <laughs> and, and I suppose globally, worldwide, about services like Spotify what they pay um, artists, musicians. <coughs> uh, th there's been a great deal of discussion over the last year in particular about grants handed out by the Irish government. Some of the artists that they went to, some of them I'm sure very, very worthy of it. Some of the artists who didn't get those grants on application. Um, I'm thinking of the idea of the prodigal kiss as the son who returns home and really how welcome, worthy he or she actually is. We see um, it's got to do also with intention. In Ireland, you're either in or you're out. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And I'm fine with that because I don't need it. Uh, I made my own way. I paid my dues. I did my gigs. I worked for it. I played lots of gigs, playing my own music. And what I wonder about is, um, I was able to actually get paid royalty money for the songs for each gig. And I'm wondering why that isn't so in Ireland. Mm -hmm. I also wonder how it's possible for somebody who is a landlord or involved in pro property development or speculation can actually hold down a post as a representative of the people. When he's making laws, he or she is making laws to suit their own pocket. I don't understand it. It's completely corrupt. There is a corruption involved. The whole thing is infected with corruption. This is the Irish virus, corruption. There's a sense. And, and I'll, I'll just touch on a few lines, if I may. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. It's OK. Um, and I, I think it's important in a sense of history and that we all share a sense of that history. Um, the 
the chapel's still standing, the convent is not, along with the school where there, where me mother was taught. My mother, my mother once your, taught. Your, your mother was a teacher. Yes, yeah, she was a national school teacher and taught at Dominican convent on Leary. And your dad w- uh, worked for my dad Fort worked Dagenham. in Fort and Dagenham. Yeah. Yeah. You know, incredibly responsible positions that reflected a time. And when I listened to that song, I got a sense of, you know, everything that we can connect with. And and your work is very powerful, not just in words, but in images that those words create. You know, the connection that we all have, um, I think particularly of a person of, uh, shall we say, our age and perhaps older, the sense of meetings that inspired relationships and marriages and families that began under Cleary's <coughs> clock or the pillar or yeah. wherever in Dublin, you know, and then that other powerful line, you know, all memories wait. Yeah. Well, what? I, I don't want to, and I know artists sometimes hate this, when you you said and wrote and sang all memories wait what what i mean is there's a sense of what's past is past and what we've lost and a sense of what we're left with what are all memories waiting for now Okay, I, I, there's one thing I want to explain. When I was a kid, sure, I, was not sure. allowed to, I was not allowed to paint. Really? Yeah, I wasn't allowed to paint because my mother couldn't it's paint. So, it's something that many kids are actually encouraged to do. It's like, oh, yeah, well, get your colour and book out and your pencils out and go away and colour on. Busy. My, my response to that was to paint with words. Mm-hmm. So that's what, what created what you're describing there, right? Now, um, if we go into just let me have a look at the the lyric there um and here is a place where old memories wait where fates spin their threads by the leeson street gate and plants for the blind are all labeled in braille we hadn't a chance and so how could we fail where beckett and oscar and yates had their day and joyce had to leave to be able to stay thin lizzie's fill linnets back from the crusades his statue looks at you outside of McDade's. You see, um, I'm painting. I'm not thinking. I'm just writing. When mm-hmm. I write, I just write. I don't. I yeah, don't think yeah. because uh, thinking is the enemy of creativity. Because the first thought you will get is, "Can I do this?" And the answer is, "No, you can't," because you're thinking. You're doing something else. Um, so there's a playfulness in my stuff because I go back in a way to the child in me. I have a very, very direct connection there. So when I when I sit down to write, uh, I basically do it uh, in cafes. I sit down for two hours max and I write. I just write. I don't think I just write. And usually I have a line maybe that I take with me from home. I have my phone. I I write the line or you know I, I I record the line in the phone and I have a line to start and then I that gives me a beginning um, and in a way it's kind of like automatic writing I can't remember writing stuff of course I can but not really um, because I'm living so much in the moment it's so intense that the thing is writing itself I don't know if that makes any sense to you I think it makes sense to an awful lot of creative artists, whether they paint, whether they write poetry, whether they write short stories or novels. I think it makes sense to them when you review something you've written and there is a moment afterwards. It could be a few hours later. It could be the following day. And it's that sense of. Where's that line? Uh, uh, and Joyce had to leave to be able to stay. Yeah. And there's a sense yeah. in that that 
you have to sometimes view your work from outside to see it in what it is. And am I right in in that sense of um, when you say like automatic writing and you look back no, and well, say, well, my, did, yeah. did I write that or or what was I thinking or what was going on in my mind when I wrote that? And in no, a sense, don't, you, no, I don't. I don't even think. I don't even think that. You don't, I don't process think, it that way. No, no, no. I, I don't think. What was I thinking? No, no. Uh, the thing I think is, ha! Huh, I've written another song they won't play on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, and then I I laugh because, uh, and then I think uh, I've actually done what I set out to do. Yeah. Without meaning to, you know. Um, I'm not. I'm interested in writing stuff that makes some kind of sense to me. And if it makes sense to other people, fair dues, then I'm happy. Uh, it used to it, be it, cool, now he's yesterday's news. <laughs> that's a play on his name, you know, uh, Oshin McCool. Yeah. Uh, and I enjoy doing stuff like that. That's that's fun. There's when a you playfulness, can get it. isn't there? there? I mean, admit it, there, yeah, there's yeah. a real playfulness <laughs> in, in what yeah. you do. Yeah. But that's fun, you know. That's when you're having a good day, kind of, you know, uh, where you you, you kind of get a line, you you, you kind of smile, you know, and says, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, I like the, the like the line with Joyce or the the line with uh, yeah. Oshin, you know, he used to be cool, but he, now he's yesterday's news, you know. For want of a horse, he'd be taking the Lewis, you know, um, <laughs> <laughs> because that basically puts him back in Dublin, you know. He's back in Dublin, and he kind of forget about the horses, you know, they're out and. Leopardstown or wherever the hell they are, you know, but the Lewis, so he takes the Lewis. And I, I imagine him sitting there kind of with his sword and his armor and everything and sitting there, you know, and looking out the window and watching the world go by. I mean, the yeah, um, there was a story about a very famous musician uh, who discovered that the bus that stopped outside his door went right to the studio. Now, this is a big name. I won't say who it was. Yeah, yeah. Was. So he gets on the bus and he thinks, this is brilliant. You know, I get on the bus. So he gets on the bus and this lady conductor comes up and she sees him and recognizes. What are you doing on my bus? This is for working class people. Get off. <laughs> um, the final line. In Prodigal Kiss from where I keep my dreams, yeah. a touch or a glimpse or a prodigal kiss. It's that final sense of rejection versus <coughs> acceptance. Possibly, uh, it's it's longing. That line is full of longing. It's it's there. It is an incredible longing. Before we finish on Prodigal Kiss, ju just in an overall sense, as the first <coughs> song we've heard from the album Where I Keep My Dreams, what what I haven't asked you, what what led you to write this album? Um, the time was right. I, some of the songs, um, Listener's Choice, for example, which we'll be playing later on, that was written in 1980. It's coming up shortly. We're, we're, we're going to be playing it very shortly. Yeah. Uh, that was written in 83, you know. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I have the stuff. You see, um, the reason I didn't make an album about Ireland before was because I didn't want to be pigeonholed as an Irish musician. Because then people would expect me to play Irish songs and Irish music. So I turn up at a gig and I'd be doing my own stuff and people would be terribly disappointed. And I didn't want to do that. Mm. I didn't want to have to deal with people's disappointment, which would be reasonable. If I was going out as an Irish musician, then it would be expected that I played Irish music. It's a trap. Um, and I didn't I just didn't see myself doing that because that isn't the kind of music. I love the music, but it's not the kind of music I'm playing. So then I got to the stage where now. Um, it's something happened. I had the material. Uh, I wrote the lyric to This Is Where I Keep My Dreams, which is about climbing trees as a kid. 
I wrote that in 1998 when I'd been back in Ireland. And I actually filmed the footage for that on a on a, uh, a cine, a little uh, Super cine 8 cam. camera. Yeah. Yeah, cine cam. Yeah, Super 8. And um, that was about uh, basically climbing trees, the, the coming of age kind of process. Um, so when I started writing, I discovered an awful lot of things uh, in a way. Uh, you know, I sat down and, and I, the just the stuff started to pour out of me. Mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking, it was just pouring out of me. Um, yeah. OK. Yeah. Maybe it's time we took a listen to our second track. We just touched upon it there. Listener's yeah. choice. OK. Listener's choice. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Everybody, uh, this is where I keep my dreams. The album by John Buckley McQuaid. And this is listener's choice. <laughs> I wrote to Dublin, the radio station, but none of the jockeys replied. No jockey replied. Maybe they were busy, they must have been busy. I won't say I'm sorry I tried. Sorry I tried. Someday I'll show them I'll blow their indifference away And if I don't make it I'll know how to fake it Faking it's part of the game The game that we play I spoke to Frances, she's married and dances with me when her husband's away Her husband's away She told me stories of others before me She's trapped, but she's happy that way She's happy that way Someday I'll show her I'll blow her indifference away And if we don't make it we'll know how to fake it Faking it's part of the game The game that we play La 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 and waiters and little dictators I've watched all the eyes on TV Eyes on TV Expect me to listen But why should I listen? Cause they never listen to me Listen to me Someday I'll show them I'll throw my indifference away And if I don't make it I won't try to fake it Faking it's part of the game The game that they play La 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 John, in that track we talked previously about, and, and we, you, several times we've sort of laughed and joked about it, about the sense of um, Irish radio play 
for Irish artists, whether they're within Ireland or living abroad, uh, getting radio play. Again, it's it's like so many issues that over the last uh, two years of the pandemic that have, have come up uh, and the difficult times facing artists who depend so much on what what we generally call the live scene, playing gigs for, for so many musicians. Um, whether it's playing in the streets, busking, which Ireland ha- has had a great tradition for. And I know that's what sort of took you originally via London to uh, Denmark. Yeah. Um, it's tough for musicians but it's tougher now than it's ever been because outside of live gigs, most, and probably in fairness, the vast majority of Irish musicians don't have much of another revenue stream. Yeah. Can you just talk a little bit about that? And I know your situation might be slightly different in that you've also diversified and you know I, I want to remind people as well that that you know as I've said in the bio you've uh, you're an illustrator and we'll talk maybe a little bit about uh, fairy tales and your ebook um you've defer and and maybe in fact that's possibly a message that now for <coughs> modern musicians whether you're Irish or wherever you come from that there is a degree of thinking outside the box that that if the last two years have reminded us it's how important live gigs are for musicians but also musicians need to think beyond that as well in their creative skills am I right or or am I wrong about that talk a little bit about that okay I can tell you a few thoughts I've had about that it's this we live in a celebrity culture yeah. John Updike has written, celebrity is a mask that eats the face. Now, I can talk about many, many different things. And sometimes I'm tempted not to because I've done things my way and I don't know how much sense it will make to anybody else. Unless they're prepared to actually listen, they won't learn anything. Mm-hmm. I've had to learn because it's all a learning process. We live and we learn. That's why we're born. I believe we're born to learn specific things, specific lessons. And we actually uh, are born into certain families to teach us these lessons. I believe that we actually choose the families we're born into before we're born into them. Now that'll probably get a a scream of outrage. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm cool with that. This is my theory. I'm just talking for me. Um, now, I'm in the, the, how can I say, the privileged position that I can do whatever I want. But whether I was or not, I've always done that. That's the way I'm wired. Um, you see, back to the celebrity culture. Foreign musicians come in and play maybe Croke Park and they get obscene amounts of money for doing it. In a country where musicians have not had any income for the past two years. Hmm. Now, the thing is this. That's the fan culture and the celebrity culture. If you want to keep a living musicians, music scene or culture scene, you know, you have to support it. If you don't support it, if you don't kind of, you know, share people's, there's no solidarity. That's what I'm missing. I'm missing solidarity. Uh, nobody cares. Everybody's in there for what they can get. And that's OK. But it doesn't lead anywhere. Um, 
we have to support ourselves. If we don't support ourselves, nobody's going to. And the music scene is going to die, basically. Uh, or, or narrow so much into so little. Well, that's, that's, not, that's refle- it's not reflective of anything that's actually going on, which which essentially is what music from decades and decades ago when it <clears throat> first began, like poetry and word of like poetry began as word of mouth. Music began as folk song telling stories of life. And it grew into this thing where we listen to a song, a piece of music, and we attach ourselves on a sense of what we talked about with the last song, a sense of memory and the value of that memory and the identification of it. But am I right in saying it? But it goes, it it should go beyond that. Hold on a second. As, as no, this, tell you. Yeah. As a listener, it should go beyond that. It should mean ju- more than just that, just what you take yeah, from it. Involvement, yeah. OK, um, look, listen's choice. I wrote to Dublin, the radio station, but none of the jockeys replied. No jockey replied. Maybe they were busy. They must have been busy. I won't say I'm sorry I tried. Someday I'll show them I'll blow their indifference away. And if I don't make it, I'll know how to fake it. Faking it's part of the game, the game that we play. I spoke to Frances. She's married and dances with me when her husband's away. She told me stories of others before me. She's trapped, but she's happy that way. Someday I'll show her. I'll blow her indifference away. And if we don't make it, we know how to fake it. Faking it's part of the game, the game that we play. Actors and waiters and little dictators, I've watched all the eyes on TV. Expect me to listen. But why should I listen? Because they never listen to me. Someday I'll show them I'll throw my indifference away. And if I don't make it, I won't try to fake it. Faking it's part of the game, the game that they play. That song talks about personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. That's the bottom line there. Um, And with responsibility, we play, we all have a role. Yeah. Whether we love music. We go to gigs, we buy records, whatever, but we all have a role. Yeah. But it's as long as we understand that there's a responsibility in that role and we're not, shall I say, inverted commas, just playing that role. Well, see, the thing is, uh, music is different for many people, you know, kind of Mm -hmm. some people can't even hear the words they just hear the sound and that's fine that's the way they experience it yeah, it's, and yeah, if you, it's expect, if you yeah. expect anything more from people you're going to be disappointed because expectation uh, contains the seeds of disappointment um basically at the end of the day it doesn't really matter it really doesn't matter we do what we do, and is there a, uh, is, is, we get you know we get to certain stages of our lives or whatever. Now, the interesting thing is this: when you get into a stage where you can actually do something, it's what you choose to do that makes things interesting. I mean, I started out writing for whatever the reason; it doesn't matter. But then I actually got fascinated by the actual process by what came out of it. So, again, it's like, you know, where does it begin and where does it end? It's that kind of thing. Um, I'm happiest when I'm writing. Because then I know, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm doing it and I know I'm doing it. That's wonderful. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful experience to just let go and i mean it's only a song it's but it's I've, it's well I've, I've learned to write from actually playing gigs for people so what i want the lyric to do is to actually go out and grab people by the throat by the mm-hmm. ears as the case may be 
that's my that's where I'm coming from. I want to write the thing so that it kind of jumps off the page. That's my feeling about it. I miss passion. Passion. Respect. And appreciation. For the arts in, in all its facets, whether it's music, <laughs> yeah, all its facets, painting, doesn't matter, yeah. But and we. As Irish people, both as Irish people <coughs> and globally, people look upon Ireland as the saints, the scholars, the artists. But is there also within Ireland a certain As much as we celebrate and regale the arts, is there a certain degree of indifference to it? There's an indifference which hides an incredible amount of sadness. Which lays beneath the surface. Yeah. And we're probably going to be talking more about that uncomfortable. And that sadness, that sadness is pacifying and it paralyzes people mm -hmm. not that they realize it or think about it this is the way i feel about it you know it, it's incredibly paralyzing that sadness there's a um perhaps it's the celtic nature i don't know i think you're right i think there's definitely something in the the celtic nature uh, dean swift wrote uh, the irish the mad irish whose whose songs were sad and whose wars were merry <laughs> that's the way um the irish mentality i think is and that there's another thing as well you know a, a thing that i really like is that you know um the english the british stole our language <laughs> and we taught them how to use theirs yeah yeah we yeah. have four nobel prize winners there's uh, William Butler Yeats, there's uh, Shaw, George Bernard Shaw, yeah. there's Beckett, and there is Seamus Heaney. And Beckett, in actual fact, was a kind of a, an acknowledgement of Joyce. Um, and there's an incredible amount of humour. Uh, there was one character, I can't remember his name, but it doesn't matter, it was way back, where this woman asked him to define the difference between men and women. And he said, Madam, I can't conceive. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you've got Oscar, Oscar Wilde, you know. Oscar uh, Wilde, of course, yeah. Incredible things, you know. And there's an, uh, an enormous amount of sadness in his story as well. Mm -hmm. um, his, his last words were meant to be, he looked at the wallpaper and said, well, one of us has got to go. And the other one was, uh, uh, what is it? Self-love is the beginning of a lifelong romance. And in terms of the government, there's a phrase which. A definition of a cynic is someone who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. Of nothing. Yeah. And that describes the situation in terms of the uh, national attitude, you know, the official attitude to culture. Mm -hmm. and the sense, the, of the, of the sense of the individual yeah. and society the individual within the society individual, the individual is basically an embarrassment an inconvenience that's a good way of putting it yeah yeah um what is the um the purpose of art is to comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable mm -hmm. i think that was banksy that said that and it's a very good description mm -hmm. um and we're not necessarily good at disturbing the uncomfortable 
Well, they won't allow us to. They yeah. they control the media, and that's okay. That's the way that is. Um, fortunately, we have the internet, but the internet is very split in terms of there are no longer there's no longer a solidarity involved. You know, you have uh, different groups, and they basically have certain issues. What I dream of is that all these groups, regardless of their issues, and rightful issues, mm -hmm. I dream of them all getting together and being, you know, collecting together and helping each other. That's my dream. And compassion. You know, compassion, that's what we're missing. We're simply missing compassion. Empathy, compassion. Yeah. And it's been uh, sorely tested over the last two years. We see that the last two years of Corona has basically shown people who they are. Mm. The worst thing you can do with people is isolate them because we are a social animal. Mm. Most of us anyway. And they have been confronted with isolation and solitude. And normally, um, when you're going about your usual business, we can't go back. There's no going back. People don't get this, but there's no going back. Um, people don't realize that they they don't they cannot lo they can no longer flee from their monsters or whatever's bothering them. Mm. You know, for me, there are two kinds of people in the world, generally speaking. Generally, there are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the first is up to the horizons in, 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 in emotional garbage and they do everything they can to get out of it. Mm. And the second type, they're up to their eyeballs in emotional garbage and they do everything they can to stay in it. <laughs> and if that's now, not an oxymoron, I don't know what is. <laughs> sometimes we're a combination of both. You know? Um, and there's an increase of, you know, everything has become extreme because we've been confronted with ourselves, basically, where, you know, Corona has been a kind of a mirror that we stare into. And mirrors are work. Mirrors work. It's a fascinating, fascinating analogy. Mirrors work two ways. They reflect what we can be and could be, but they also scare us as to what we are in a moment. Mirrors are a work in progress. A work in pro. I love it. A work in progress. <laughs> um, and that's why, if you looked at the thing, you see, we were all wearing the masks, right? Mm. And again, it's a, it's a funny kind of situation. You know, you're putting on a mask, but you're staring at a mirror. OK, but, you know, there was there was one person I saw on the net where she wrote, I've been wearing this mask for years now yeah. and I've been telling people to fuck off behind the mask. And I don't know if I can troll myself now that the mask is gone. <laughs> I'll be able to stop myself too. Because I've been liberated. <laughs> now, the thing is this. Um, much of the corona thing is 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 due to stupidity. Now, I probably get probably somebody won't me shoot me for saying that, but there were simple things we could do: keep our distance, wash our hands. And what I discovered here anyway was that people had great trouble keeping their distance. I'll give you an example: I'm going to Aldi. Sorry about the advertising, but I'm going no, to the yeah, supermarket. Right, right. Right? They'll, they'll be delighted. And, I'll, I'll get sponsorship and, now from them. Yeah, right. <laughs> and the thing is this, there's a row of bicycle. There's a rack of bicycle places where you can put your bicycle, right? So I stick it there in the bicycle thing. And I went to the store. And, and I'm standing there in the queue and this guy is starting to approach me. So I hold out my crash helmet to keep him, make him keep his distance. So I get out. And I go out of the thing. He keeps his distance. That's fine. People will do it when you remind them. Right. But they're not thinking. So they don't remember. So anyway, I'm going out and I find that there's a bicycle, even though there's loads of space 
and it's parked right beside mine. So I can barely breathe. And of course, your man who wouldn't keep his distance or did keep his distance eventually, he comes out. And of course, it's his bicycle. Of course. Right. So I just stood back and I waited for him to get his stuff together so he could leave so I could get out my bicycle. And he turned to me and says, no, you're not so glad for being infected. And I said, are you? Uh, there's an incredible distance. You know, there's a, there's something missing between here and here. Yeah. People want to fly. They want to travel. They want to do this and the other. What they're doing is they're prolonging the agony. Now, you can argue, but we need a holiday. We haven't been away for two years. Yeah, 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 that's yeah. true. That's true. I understand that. But I mean. My reaction to the thing is I've sat down and I've made albums. Not everybody has that possibility, but I mean, the world before Corona and the world of Corona wasn't that much different for me because I lead a solitary existence. I have friends, but I spend a lot of time alone. I enjoy being alone. When I go to cafes, I'm alone. I write. This is my life. This is what makes sense to me. I do something that I'm really, really happy doing. I know this. I can ask people, are you happy? And it's a very interesting question. Like, for example, um, I can take a skull and put it in front of me, in front of people and say, is that male or female? Is that black, white or green? Mm -hmm. We have to strip away the illusions. What are we really, really dealing with? Um, what are we really seeing in front of us? Uh, I think that most people are, are people are programmed from birth. And there are lessons we have to learn. And the thing about programming is this, to actually unprogram ourselves, we have to actually see what the program is, what the programming is. And we can, the only way we can see that, the curse of programming is that we can't see it. It's invisible to us until we start to study our patterns, what we keep doing. And the minute you study your patterns, then you can see what the programming is and you can do something about it. If it's making you unhappy, then you can do something about it. Um, I'm the offspring of two alcoholics. Which means that I, I have a very sensitive antenna for people. I read people. Mm -hmm. It's the key in the door. Ah, the key comes in the door. You can hear it rattling in the door. What do I have to do to survive when they come in? That's the bottom line. On that note, I think it will be a very appropriate time to go to our next track. What? Girls Who Lived in Hell <clears throat> from your album. This is where I keep my dreams. Let's take a listen. They're tearing down the laundries where cruelty prevailed in gardens with forbidden trees whose walls we never scaled. Behind those gates they hid the shame that wasn't theirs to hide. They took our clothes and changed our names and trampled on our pride. Another Mary Magdalene, another stolen child, another broken covenant, another life defiled. They 
said we had no place to go with evil in our wombs. As angels fell like flakes of snow from Donnybrook to June, they sent our babes across the sea in ships of grief and greed. For every babe would only be another mouth to feed. Another Mary Magdalene, another stolen child, another broken covenant, another life defiled. While the Doyle and Diocese refuse to separate And keep on doing as they please The rest of us can't wait To recognize what went before A truth we know so well There is a place in heaven for those girls who live in hell. Another Mary Magdalene, another stolen child, another broken covenant, another life defiled. Okay, you were just listening there to um, The Girls Who Lived in Hell uh, from This Is Where I Keep My Dreams uh, by John Buckley McQuaid, who's still with me. Um, John, do you know what struck me when I was doing research for this program? It was that even I didn't realize the last of the, you know, your line, they're tearing down the laundries where cruelty prevailed. I hadn't realized how recently the last of those laundries were torn down. 1996. That's right. The one my God, them. my God. That's not so long ago. Just, just for listeners. I know some of the backstory. You've researched it, obviously, in writing this album. But just, just fucking hell. Pa paint is the wrong is the wrong expression. But just, just briefly tell us the story for for people who maybe are not familiar with this. I know there were situations in the United States and particularly Canada. Um who might identify with the, the Magdalene laundries, but but just 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 describe what these institutions were. OK, I'll start. I'll start in this way. OK, they're tearing down the laundries where cruelty prevailed in gardens with forbidden trees whose walls we never scaled behind those gates. They hid the shame that wasn't theirs to hide. They took our clothes and changed our names and trampled on our pride. Another Mary Magdalene, another stolen child, another broken covenant, another life defiled. They said we had no place to go with evil in our wombs as angels fell like flakes of snow from Donnybrook to Tume. They sent our babes across the sea in ships of grief and greed for every babe would only be another mouth to feed, another Mary Magdalene, another stolen child, another broken covenant, another life defiled. 
And while the Doyle and Diocese refuse to separate and keep on doing as they please, the rest of us can't wait to recognize what went before, a truth we know so well. There is a place in heaven for those girls who lived in hell. Another Mary Magdalene, another soul and child, another broken covenant, another life defiled. That basically describes um, what, you know, um, since since writing the song, I've, I've run into many, many people um, who have been affected by these places. Uh, the original idea for the song came from a movie, a film called um, Sex in a Cold Climate, where it was a story of four girls, a documentary mm -hmm. about four girls. Yeah. And one of the girls got caught stealing apples from a convent apple tree. So she got stuck in one of these Magdalene laundries. And that outraged me so much. I was so angry about it that I sat down and wrote this. Um, since then... I also saw that, you know, the several different films, there's Philomena and there's um, the Magdalene Sisters. You know, those Sisters of Charity are the Bon Secours Sisters of Charity. I call them the Sisters of Cruelty and, cra and Cash because that's what they were doing. But it, was a, it, it, it was what what. And for people who don't understand these were institutions where <coughs> young girls were sent and they could be sent by a judge you know if you committed a a, a minor crime or no, you could it, be... it was for unmarried mothers you know yeah, yeah it's, essentially it's yeah big sin. yeah it yeah. was a big sin you know in ireland at the time it was a big sin if you didn't have a husband if you if you uh basically had an illegit you got pregnant outside wedlock, right? So you get stuck in one of these places and you were made to work from dawn to dusk and you got no money. You got lousy food and there were big big walls around the thing. You couldn't get out. No, and but what, is, what, what I mean is you could legally you could legally be sent there, but equally in secrecy, even a family might bring the young daughter there. Yeah, but they would. And the thing is this, you couldn't yeah. get out unless somebody sprung you out of the place. And they were making yeah. money on this. They had contracts for the washing with the local town. This was actually state subsidized. Mm. Um, and they were, you know, again, they were receiving money for the girls, you know, for their upkeep, as well as, as making the girls work like mad. So it was a, it was a total money making business. And not only that, they had the added joy, sadistic joy of saying to the girls, you had your fun. Now you can have the pain that, that goes the, with it. Yeah. Yeah. The pain that goes with it, you know, and that's that's what was going on. And not only that, if a girl went to England to have the baby, they would go over. They had a thing for rescuing these babies and bringing them back to Ireland, whether they wanted to be brought back or not. Girls were brought back as well. The, the pregnant mothers were brought back to places like Bessborough. I've talked to some people like this. Um, it says a lot that you didn't realize that the last one closed in 1996. And I mean, yeah. you're a journalist. Yeah, and, and that, that's that's a you, genuine, honest. Yeah. I, 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 I actually well, thought it was sometime during the early mid 80s. Yeah. This is it, you know, I, I mean, uh, that's how well concealed the thing is. And we accept the concealment like the Nazis accepted the concentration camps, you know, the, the, the German people. Accepted the existence of the concentration camps. It was not spoken about. Just as these places were not spoken about, 
They were in other than in whispers. They were convenient. Yeah, it's a way of, you know, but that's because the church had a stranglehold on the population in terms of morals. And they still have a stranglehold on the people. Um, Ireland is a great place. For pretending to do something to be seen to be doing it, but there's no reality behind it. Um, they make uh, laws. But to actually and then they put obstacles in place in way of people using their rights. Um, there's been the new abortion, you know, the, the, the uh, access to abortion. Mm-hmm. This is an illusion. Most people are still leaving the country if they want to uh, terminate a pregnancy mm-hmm. because to get a it's it's still very, very, very difficult. To terminate an abortion in Ireland. There are a limited amount of places where you can go, and not only that, they put you through all kinds of hoops before you can get it. I've talked to people. Um, And another thing about these places. They change the girls names. But there's an extra thing involved here. If a girl came in and her name was Marianne O'Reilly. Uh, that's a fictional name. Uh, uh, fictional name. Right? It's a fictional name. I just want to make an up uh, just off the top of my head. Right now, um, <clears throat> she'd get the upkeep from the state, which would be maybe nine quid, which is a lot of time, a lot of money at the time. A lot of money at the time, yeah, in the yeah. 60s, 70s even. And then what the nuns would do, uh, they would farm out the girl or get the girl adopted. And they change the name to Anne Mary O'Reilly and get another nine quid. Now, I don't know. This is something I've been told. I don't know if it's true, but it would certainly be uh, of interest for an outside forensic accountant to come in and study those files and check. Is this true? And how much money has the Catholic Church siphoned off through the convents throughout the centuries? I'd say it's in the it's it's in the region of billions. And unfortunately, <clears throat> we've had. Like in Ireland, which has a policy of. To investigate any scandal, historical scandal. Commissions <clears throat> after commissions after commissions that go on for years and years and years. And you eventually realize these commissions are really not about investigating anything. They're to bury evidence, silence victims, and essentially bury everything as much as babies were buried. The recent um, Ryan Commission, wasn't it? And the Mull and Baby Homes Commission, those two. Um, that was quite interesting, in fact, because they took witness statements and ignored them and redacted them. The purpose of that commission was to conceal, not to reveal, as you say, to bury. Mm. Um, the person in charge of that commission refused to answer questions to the Doyle. That person was paid to do a job. They went out of the country and they talked about it, but they would not answer questions to the Doyle. And I think there's something really, really radically wrong there. You pay someone to do a job and then they say, oh, we won't answer questions about that. I don't understand. I simply don't understand. Well, you know. Those commissions are made to whitewash. Oh, there wasn't really a problem anyway. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. There were different times. It, it was part of the times. I'm kind of going. A crime. Has no time. A crime is a crime is a crime. It's got Fair. nothing. To do with the time. Yeah, it's the exact same. You what they do there, they steal babies, they sell the babies. They use the babies to get money from the government. 
This is a crime. You know what it's like if somebody gets caught uh, cheating the social today. They come out down on them like a, a ton of bricks. I don't understand why they haven't done that to the church. It's the same crime. There's no difference whatsoever. The difference a, is that it's on a huge organized scale. There's a line in the song that we heard. <coughs> As angels fell like flakes of snow from Donnybrook to Tune. I thought it powerful that you chose those two words. Donnybrook to Tune, and, and just to clarify for, for people listening or maybe not familiar with uh, yeah. Donnybrook. Do, Donnybrook is a, is a, what, what would be considered a, a middle class affluent area of um, Ireland. Uh, Tune is obviously connected with the uh, tune babies uh, scandal but the paradox and the confrontation of those two are in essence for me from Donnybrook to tune the sense of state and church the state represented by Donnybrook as the entombed home of RTE the state broadcaster and the, tune, but, but a, one of the most uh, modern Mick, scandals in Ireland. Mick, Go there on. was an yeah. institution, there was one of those institutions in Donnybrook. In, in, yeah, you know, in Donnybrook. Yeah. But you never hear of it. No, you don't. And and the thing yeah. is, you know, when I'm writing, you know, um, a line like that, I'll check, uh, you know, uh, lyrically, you have to find a word that works. But you also want to find a work that's true, a word that's true, you know, and actually you picked out a good line there, you know, as angels fell like flakes of snow from Donnybrook to Tune. Yeah. Um, I think every line in the song says says what it's meant to say. Um, it's we're a nation of powerlessness, powerless people. To recognise what went before, a truth we know so well. Yeah. You see, beyond all these, all this cruelty and Great callousness, not acknowledging. There is, there is compassion in people. It's just mm -hmm. buried. That's what the church has managed to do. It has managed to bury people's compassion underneath a veil of hypocrisy, lies and greed. Do you know, when I consider the <coughs> Magdalene Laundries and I look back at Ireland in the 1980s. Yeah. And I reflect back. Do you remember the Dunn's workers? Yeah. And the whole thing about apartheid in South Africa. I can't remember that because I wasn't in Ireland at the time. Oh, OK, OK. These were the Dunn's workers effectively protesting. Um, yeah about the situation that was going on and yeah. the outpouring of support and how Irish people nationally and internationally, in fairness, are renowned for their sense of empathy and charity. But sometimes that empathy and charity extends to something far away yeah. and somewhere else and not yeah, here just, and of us yeah. in the village yeah. and the towns and the cities. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's the street angel and house devil. Mm -hmm. Syndrome. It's 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 great. Oh, we can allow ourselves to feel compassion for for everybody else. 
Well, we don't deserve compassion. We've been brought up on a, on a, on a legacy of guilt and shame. Um, forgive me, Lord, for I have sinned. I promise not to sin again. Unless, of course, I get the chance, I beg forgiveness in advance. I used to be a Catholic, magnificently guilty. The sex was good from Hollywood to fabulously filthy. That's from a, a lyric I wrote called Confessions of a Catholic Kid. Um, we are our own worst enemies. And it's a kind of a, it's, it's sanctioned masochism. And by not taking responsibility for the reality we're living in, we create some really, really, really cruel uh, consequences. There are women who cannot get their files. There are women, women that have health problems. There are even, there are also men that have problems now, but they are considered inconvenient. And they're not listened to. They're fobbed off with the one excuse and the other. Um, I believe that the church are waiting for these people to die. To die. Problem solved. It's a it's a it's a, it's a basically it's a politics of uh, what do you call it? Uh, delay. Uh, I see the Pope, Pope Francis. Um, I consider him to be a figurehead who delays things. He's supposed to be progressive. He's not. He's not in the slightest progressive. When they had that recent scandal about the altar boys or the choir boys in the Vatican, their reaction to that was the school was in the Vatican. There was an abuse scandal. Mm -hmm. What they did was they moved the school out of the Vatican. End of problem. Problem solved. Which, which it, it, in a sense, virtually every parish, every town, every city in Ireland <coughs> speak about a priest who committed crimes and indecent acts who was simply moved from one place to another or moved abroad to the missions. And the, the problem was essentially moved from place to place to place. Delay, 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 deny. I'll tell you, there was one case and only one case where somebody was convicted of forging birth certificates. This is the only case in Ireland. Mm -hmm. That was a woman called Mary Keating. She ran a place called St. Rita's Nursing Home. She was a midwife. She ran it from, I think, 1948. They found her guilty of doing this. She went to her parish priest or to her priest who went to the TD, the local TD. And they did not lift her license. She continued. What they do is they didn't, you know, uh, uh, they they had both legal and uh, unmarried. Yeah, had married mothers and unmarried mothers, right? And the unmarried mothers, they would, a week before the, the child was to be delivered, uh, a couple would come over from the States. They'd put their names on the birth certificate and they'd go back off to the States uh, and pay for the privilege. So she was making money doing this. This continued even after she was convicted of it. I was born there. Mm -hmm. I found that out when I was um, doing this project. I looked at my birth certificate and I saw 68 Sanford Road. And I looked it up just curiosity. I Googled it and then I came across St. Regis Nursing Home. And I thought, oh, OK, if my mother hadn't been married to my father, I would have ended up in New York. Instead, I ended up living with two alcoholics. I don't know which was better. But it's, you know, uh, that's that's fantasy in a way. You know, um, I have the life I have. I'm happy. I'm satisfied with that life. I've learned an awful lot. Um, 
And I'm in a position now where I can write songs like this. And that's, I believe, my purpose. That's what I do. And the album has been great in that the things I have, you know, that, that are latent in me are coming out and being expressed. I'm missing that. I don't hear many people doing it. Not my emotions, but things about these things, talking about these subjects that nobody talks about. And that's the reason I read the lyric. You know, I, I read the two lyrics yeah. now because um, they express what I want to say better than I can do just, you know, as we're talking now. Yeah. Because they're concise. I'm I'm totally focused when I'm writing that stuff. I'm just focused. Um, and I don't question her. I just do it. It's great. I mean, it's 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 a it's a high. It's higher than any drug I know. I've never been into drugs in whatsoever because they have they would have limited my vision. John, I think this is an appropriate time to take our next track. Um, okay. From this is where I keep my dreams, and this is land of the Magdalens. I was born in the land of the Magdalen laundries back in the 50s. The living was tough with the Christian brothers and sisters of charity. Twenty-one years, Lord, was more than enough. Here's to the island of saints and of scholars. Here's to the biblical beasts of the field. Here's to the kingdom of clerical collars. Here's to the wounds that may never be healed. Well, we squandered our dreams in the pubs of posterity, sang all the songs at the top of our lungs. We were rebels by birth in the face of adversity, curses and quips on the tips of our tongues. Here's to the island of saints and of scholars, Here's to the biblical beasts of the field. Here's to the kingdom of clerical collars. Here's to the wounds that may never be healed. Sure, they offered us up to the gods of skullduggery, blessing our babies and drinking our blood. As they tortured our lives with their constant begrudgery So many left while the going was good Here's to the island of saints and of scholars Here's to the biblical beasts of the field Here's to the kingdom of clerical collars Here's to the wounds that may never be healed. Oh, the laughter was loud on the mailboat to Hollyhead. Cold was the sea as we sailed with the tide, and a full moon shone bright in the eyes of each traveler. Passionate hearts that would not be denied. Here's to the island of saints and of scholars Here's to the biblical beasts of the field Here's to the kingdom of clerical collars Here's to the wounds that may never be healed Now we're spread to the winds like the wild geese of history Telling our tales in the cafes and bars With our silence and cunning enshrouded in mystery 
Under the sun and the moon and the stars Here's to the island of saints and of scholars Here's to the biblical beasts of the field Here's to the kingdom of clerical collars Here's to the wounds that may never be healed That's land of the uh, Magdalens, uh, <coughs> John Buckley, McQuaid, uh, still with me. Uh, John, a lot of, in that song, a lot of the themes from the previous song are carried through. I, I sensed with this one, there was a more sharper personal view. Would that be fair to say? Well, this is my story. Yeah. You know, uh, this is all our stories, uh, but this is yeah, a personal story yeah, well, for you as well. Is, you know, we're talking about diaspora. If we talk about diaspora, right? Each one of us who leaves the country and doesn't return is a diaspora in themselves. And that's what this is about. I call it Land of the Magdalens because it was uh, it was a perfect title to describe what we're running away from. Uh we're running away from we're running to we're running to we're running away from it's it's part and parcel of the same thing as fight and flight um i was born in the land of the magdalene laundries back in the 50s the living was tough with the christian brothers and sisters of charity 21 years lord was more than enough here's to the island of saints and of scholars Here's to the biblical beasts of the field. Here's to the kingdom of clerical collars. Here's to the wounds that may never be healed. Well, we squandered our dreams in the pubs of posterity, sang all our songs at the top of our lungs. We were rebels by birth in the face of adversity, curses and quips on the tips of our tongues. Here's to the island of saints and of scholars. Here's to the biblical beasts of the field. Here's to the kingdom of clerical colours. Here's to the wounds that may never be healed. Sure, they offered us up to the gods of skullduggery, blessing our babies and drinking our blood as they tortured our lives with their constant begrudgery. So many left while the going was good. Here's to the island of saints and of scholars. Here's to the biblical beasts of the field. Here's to the kingdom of clerical collars. Here's to the wounds that may never be healed. Oh, the laughter was loud on the mail boat to Hollyhead. Cold was the sea as we sailed with the tide. And a full moon shone bright in the eyes of each traveller. Passionate hearts that would not be denied. Here's to the island of saints and of scholars. Here's to the biblical beasts of the field. Here's to the kingdom of clerical collars. Here's to the wounds that may never be healed. Now we're spread to the winds like the wild geese of history, telling our tales in the cafes and bars, with our silence and cunning enshrouded in mystery under the sun and the moon and the stars. Here's to the island of saints and of scholars. Here's to the biblical beasts of the field. Here's to the kingdom of clerical collars. Here's to the wounds that may never be healed. We were rebels by birth in the face of adversity. Ireland is perceived by friends and foe <coughs> abroad as and uh, we also celebrate this so much in our national anthem and our history as rebels are we still rebels today 
I'll tell you something. Somebody once said the reason why Irish people were so popular outside the country was because, because we never invaded anybody. <laughs> now, the thing is this. We're just here to we, visit. <laughs> the reason we never invaded anybody is because we were too busy murdering each other. <laughs> we are an argumentative nation. We love to argue. Which means that we cannot cooperate. The rebels in 1916 were not popular until the Brits started to shoot them. They were disturbing people in their comfort. They were spat upon when they came out of the GPO for disturbing the peace and for disturbing people's bus routes or what have you. But then the Brits made the fatal mistake of making martyrs of them. And they stopped before they got to De Valera. But I think De Valera had a, an American passport, so he was they couldn't shoot right. him. Um, one of the most disgusting pictures, photographs I've ever seen is the photograph of De Valera on his knee kissing the Archbishop's ring. Because that said everything about Ireland. The Archbishop it, 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 it reflected the sense of that church, state, martyrdom, that the new Irish Republic state would ultimately be formed around and the whole entire constitution but, around it. Which you have to understand, uh, at the time they were writing the constitution, McQuaid was at Blackrock College. He was he was running the place, right? Uh, he was the headmaster, or whatever you call it. The big cheese. He was sending material in to influence the writing of the Constitution. So what you what we ended up with was a Catholic Constitution. There's a special mention made of the Catholic Church in the Constitution, which is completely undemocratic. I want to see a separation of church and state. I want the church out of the schools. If they want religious education, they can have their religious education, but not in the schools. I don't want to see any religion in the schools. I want to. That's my problem with any kind of organized religion. If it's connected to the state, it is bad for the individual. Because it is a power structure that puts the ideo ideology in front of or above the people it claims to represent. What struck me about Land of the Magdalenes is, <coughs> like you, I grew up in a Catholic family. Yep. I went to school in a Catholic school, drilled in that ethos that we, we've spoken about. Were you conscious when you wrote Land of the Magdalene's that it's, and I don't mean this the wrong way, but mm. it, it reads like um, a hymn or prayer in the way it's structured. No, that's interesting. You know, here's to the <laughs> island of saints and scholars, here's to the beach and <laughs> Rats! That was never my intention. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's fine. You know, I mean, but I mean, it's a ballad. Yeah. Well, perhaps, perhaps I'm mixing prayer with him and ballad. Uh, but in a sense, with a lot no, of Irish I, I, lyrics, they they can be that way. If you take it as a hymn, it's an anti-hymn. Yeah, an anti ballad or you know, an anti hymn. You know, here's yeah. to the island of saints and scholars. That's what we pride ourselves on. And then the sec the next line is, here's to the biblical beasts of the field. Ha! Ah, you know, and here's to the kingdom of clerical colours. That's what they are. And here's the result is, here's to the wounds that may never be healed. That's what I'm thinking. There are wounds in Ireland, and until we address them. 
we can never heal them. And sweeping them under the, comp uh, the, 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 the carpet or having a commission to whitewash things and conceal is not dealing with things. It's not healing. It's concealing. Wounds that are concealed will fester. With our silence and cunning enshrouded in mystery. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Uh, that I, was from. I, 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 I'm kind of thinking in what we previously said about <coughs> that Irish philosophy of commissions that really delay, 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 and actually only work to enshrine the secrecy. And I sense that about that line, the sil the silence and cunning enshrouded in mystery, that that mystery is something that we almost want to self-create we like mystery you mean it's kind of romanticism yeah, the thing yeah, is, yeah, we, 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 yeah exactly yeah. we we want to ireland's past is at times troubled difficult and uncomfortable but we like inserting a degree of bravado bravado martyrdom and mystery into it because historically we are an island nation of myth and folklore and we sometimes like to think that our worst passages of time can disappear into that mystery and myth ah, the celtic twilight the celtic twilight Listen, the, the line with our sons and cunning is right that was inspired by Joyce. He said, yeah, to yeah. succeed, an Irishman needs three things. Silence, cunning and exile. So I'm referring to Joyce there because, again, he had to leave to be able to stay. You know, um, he's one of our greatest writers, but he couldn't live in Ireland. I think he le he lived in Paris. Was it Paris or France most of his life? I remember reading somebody writing about one of his classes. He was an Eng he taught English, right? And I just read this kind of uh, report from the class, and I thought I would love to have had him, him as an English teacher. He was fantastic. The guy had this he had this feel and 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 gr grasp of the language that was untouchable just fantastic very inspirational and not unlike beckett who if yeah, i'm beckett, not mistaken was, also also taught i think it was french and i think it might have been yeah. spanish he taught as well abroad Would be, yeah yeah um but they were bowsies in their own <laughs> in their own particular way, you know. And well, well, rebel, re rebels abroad. Yeah, in a way, yeah. Um, because they, they couldn't be they'd rebels, be rebels anywhere. A thing that that I thought it, you know, the thing of a stranger in a strange land. Um, I remember thinking once, it's one thing to feel a stranger in a foreign country. You expect that. It's another thing to feel a stranger in your own country. I've always felt myself a stranger in Ireland from the day I was born. I always from had that feeling. Oh, that's different now from when you're born. I, I feel that when I go back to Ireland. I always had the feeling. What the more, fuck I, I feel like a stranger. Yeah, you know, I, I thought, what the fuck am I doing here? You know, so uh, as I was saying at the very beginning, to actually realize the dreams I had, I had to leave. I simply had to leave. It wasn't possible. Um, it's like the pubs are like a swamp. Where the dreams die. Where the river Liffey streams, generations lived and died. In a haze of drunken dreams, Jesus Christ was crucified. That describes Dublin for me.
and they're they're very powerful words that sense of crucifixion yeah yeah you know meaning a, a cross to bear yeah but the thing is it's, but it's not your cross no well, you, it's, you, it's, you, did yeah. you did you leave the cross at home no, you can't leave your baggage behind you. It's it's on you. It's in you. And you can run. You can go to Mars. You still got your baggage with you. You have to sort it. I mean, I, of course, I went back and sorted it. I stayed away for a long time and then I went back and sorted it. I decided. And I achieved what I wanted to achieve with that visit or the visits I, I took at the time. That had to do with my parents. Um, was that a final goodbye go in that sense? A, a goodbye to something? No, it's every child is born more or less creative. Mm -hmm. And the rest is up to how much we encourage it. Now, <clears throat> I'm an extremely creative person. It's 24 seven. It just keeps going. Whether I'm doing the one thing or the other, it's all creative. Um, what I did was I found a side door. I always found a side door. Uh, when I was <clears throat> when I was writing lyrics, we had a housekeeper. My mother was a teacher. She was out teaching. My father was in England working. And so we had a housekeeper, a girl from the country. And she used to steal my books and burn them. The books that I wrote the lyrics in and burn them. I've written them. Notebooks. Yeah, my notebooks. Uh, of course, the, the obvious thing for me was to keep the books on me. I didn't leave them lying around after that. I didn't leave them in my room. But that was my mother's determination. You know, some alcoholics, maybe all of them, I don't know, are narcissists. And I wasn't even allowed a bicycle when I was younger. As I said, I wasn't allowed to paint. And for me, lyricism was the side door. Where I created something. What? By not allowing you to have a bicycle, the That's burning of freedom. notebooks of creation. Yeah. What were That's they trying? Control. What were they trying to deny you? Control. Uh, beyond control. just control. No, it's control. That is control. Yeah. In the in the pure sense of the word, is control. Um, and the thing is, this I mean, I was born uncontrollable. That's that's the way, you know, your, your nature is one way or the nature is yeah. you know, so it's the way you're made up, you know, and, and as soon as you kind of suss out how you're put together, uh, the better it is for the rest of the people around you. Because you're going to be at war with yourself and being at war with oneself does not have happy results with the people you're in relationships with or seeing or, or whoever, you know, uh, kind of friends, you know. Um, because it makes it makes a person unpredictable. Even though they think they're very predictable or, you know, to depend upon so on. And we don't like uncomfortable and unpredictability. Because it's, the sense of the sense of <laughs> an Irish household. And I can only speak for myself and my sense of <laughs> being and who I am and what I came from is an Irish household is about routine and predictability. An Irish household is about secrets. And secrets. No, secrets. The routine and the predictability is there to conceal the secrets. To, to conceal the secrets. It's like I knew of a an alcoholic woman who lived in an apartment, a flat, and 
She had nothing in the flat. There was a mattress on the floor to sleep on. But there were flowers in the window. That's Ireland. Flowers in the window. There's, there's a lyric in there alone. Of course she lay in a mattress with flowers on the window. <coughs> yeah. John, on that note, I think it's an appropriate time for us to move to our final track of the programme, Homeless Hotels. This is your, um, correct me if I'm wrong, this is your most recent single, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. OK. Yeah. Let's take a listen to Homeless Hotels. John Buckley McCraid. I'll tell you a tale of the homeless hotels Those chosen to serve have us under their spells We live on the street and we scrounge for a crust and curse the hyenas Betraying our trust They say that there isn't, we know that there is We're hungry and fearful and God help the kids They're lost and they're lonely and strung out on drugs They turn into monsters that nobody hugs Ireland, 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 Ireland Some get cake and some get crumb Ireland, 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 Ireland What on earth have we become? A merciless abused and denied For ages the blameless that they crucified They buried them namelessly under the sod And offered novenas in praise of their God They're burning down churches on faraway land We may not agree, but we do understand we're drinking and thinking and feeling the shame We don't have the strength to be doing the same Ireland, 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 Ireland Some get cake and some get crumb Ireland, Ireland Hotels there from John Buckley McQuaid. Um, and of course the hyenas betray, betraying our trust. The hyenas, of course, are what you refer to as um, the vulture funds and politicians supporting this quasi-nature in Ireland. Those chosen to serve choose to serve themselves. That's the problem. Mm. The thing is this, homeless figures have increased for the sex, sixth consecutive month with 
over 9,000 people in emergency com- accommodation last November. And this is in Ireland? Quote, the quote it's in the Ireland. Yeah, it's yeah. in Ireland. Yeah. Millennials still living with their parents speak of the impact on their mental health and of plans to emigrate. Young couples tell heartbreaking stories of delaying having children because they are stuck in unstable private rental housing and their life dreams are being lost because of housing policy failure. Pensioners speak of being unable to afford the rent and of facing eviction into homelessness. Is this the island we fought for and dreamed of in 1916? A government by landlords who choose to serve themselves rather than those they have been chosen to serve, who talk and talk and talk, who are shaken, but rarely, if ever, stirred. A land of vulture funds, bailed out banks and vested interest, where profit is the mantra and poverty abhorred. Abhorred. How did we get here? Where are we going? What have we become? What kind of world are we leaving to our children and grandchildren? Where's the compassion? When I heard this song, <coughs> and I know homelessness in Ireland has been a major topic of discussion. And the first question I asked myself was, my parents would have been, you know, in their 70s and 80s. Yeah. And I remember them talking about the tenements in Dublin. Yeah. I remember them talking about how the city has slowly but surely changed over decades. Yeah. I remember them talking about the whole time they my both my parents were originally born in the the inner city and they one moved out before they met one moved out to Crumlin the other moved out to uh, Drimna yeah but the one thing that struck me is although they talked about the poverty and how difficult things were but they were happy but they never talked about homelessness. Yeah. And now we are at a time, particularly since the 1980s through the 1990s and to where we are now in 2022. And now either we're talking about it more or it didn't exist then. And I'm trying to people equate cared. the two things. So people talk cared. to me a little bit about your, 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 people your, your cared thoughts. More than, and people were more supportive of each other. They took care of each other. They and, know, and, and there were more people housed in very yeah. densely populated areas than there are now. Now yeah. everybody wants to but, but, own a house. Again, and again you can ask the question, were they happy? Yeah. That's the bottom line. I mean, you know, you can have a, a swimming pool. Are you happy? Is that, you know, there's a famous rock musician who had a swimming pool. They drowned him in it. I mean, what is happiness? The greedy shall inherit the earth. That's the mantra today in Ireland. Greed is the motivating factor and all its ugliness. And the answer would be, of course, just go to the pub and get drunk. I remember I was standing in Walkenstown at a bus stop, went to take the bus into town and I had my guitar with me and the guitar is completely covered with uh, different posters and stuff like that, you know, where I've been playing. It's a real kind of pay your dues type of thing. Yeah. And uh, I got talking to a guy uh, standing at the bus stop and it turned out he was a 
an old musician. And he was on his way to a job interview. And we were, it was very nice, you know, it was interesting. It was really interesting. But as we were talking, his eyes kept straying to my guitar case, you know, without saying that, he was just looking at it. And then suddenly he says, fuck it, I'm going to the pub. That for me is a great picture. He wasn't a, going to go and get a, a light. A, a light went on. Yeah, he was going. He was after the pub, you know. But that's the thing. Um, to actually to do something in art, you actually have to have money. Wherever the money comes from, I don't know. You know, it, it can be work. You know, working in a, a supermarket, whatever. It doesn't matter. Uh, but you you actually have to. You know, there's the thing I've always thought. You know, how do you make a how do you make a small fortune from playing music? Well, you start with a large fortune. Start with a big fortune. Yeah. <laughs> <It's>, yeah. <laughs> I think most musicians will get that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, the thing is, um, I'm in this business to make a difference. That's all I can say. I have certain things and, and I just do them and that's it. Um, and I suppose I touch the things that nobody else does. Or, uh, people don't dare to do because they're afraid of losing their grants or afraid of losing their audience. Or I don't have anything to lose. I don't have any grants. I don't have any audience. I'm happy that way. But I got a comment on Girls Who Lived in Hell from a girl who'd been in one of the Magdalene laundries. And she says, I am that girl. Mm -hmm. You've got it so right. I'm going to have this song played at my funeral. That for me is worth everything. That's value. It's completely valuable. It's the best review I've ever had for anything I've done. In a private conversation we had, you talked about the vulture funds and you talked about places that you saw, particularly in Dublin, that changed. And you talked about the idea that now <coughs> that we as Irish who go back to Ireland and feel strangers in our own country. We go back and we don't see <coughs> the place as it once was. And it, it's not a romanticism or a reminiscence, but it's rather that you spoke about the idea that while we have homeless in plain sight and they're lucky if they're going from tent to hostel around them are buildings and structures that are changing and that they're changing to create an idea of tourism well, the true values and what makes Ireland an incredible country to visit is slowly but surely being chipped away. I want you to they're talk turning, to me a little bit about that. They're turning it into a plastic paradise. Mm -hmm. The thing is, a place like the Cobblestone, where many gigs have been, you know, it, it was a centre of uh, great. Uh, they're turning that down. Why? They want to build a hotel. 
Hooray. OK, the hotel is there to house the tourists. Uh, the, tourists are, the tourists are going to want some entertainment or some culture. The cobblestone's gone. It's a contradiction in terms. Keep at it long enough and you will actually have nothing to attract tourists. It'll just be, again, one more plastic paradise. And people will come from places like, whether it's London, Chicago, New York, Montreal, or whatever, and go, Ireland? This isn't the Ireland. Like, we've been in the West, we've seen your fields and your, but where's your, I think what you mean is the sense of community and city culture is disappearing and is being replaced by this. It's, it's, what, what, it's, what, it's we, what we call this, this temple bar style of culture that really didn't exist <laughs> 50 years ago. It's not only disappearing, it's being erased. Yeah. It's being erased for money. That's what the vulture fund thing is about. They're buying up bad loans, throwing people out. And of course, the, the prime minister will say, oh, they're very good at taking care of those bad loans. While ignoring what they're actually doing. It looks good. It looks good on paper. And they're not paying tax. They fought accepting tax money from Apple because they're afraid of losing investment. Now, I visualize all over Europe a basic tax structure which taxes people, I mean, companies, corporations, in the places where they make the money. No moving of funds, this, that, and the other. They pay tax on the money they make in a country. End of story. And this will finance our nurses, our schools, our roads. I don't care how rich you are. If you're driving in your Bentley or where the hell you're driving, you're still driving on the same road as a guy who's driving on a bicycle. You're using the same thing. You're using the same service that you're trying to destroy for your money. And that's why I want to see corporation taxes over the board, everywhere, all over the world. I want to see them paying their fair share. Hey, you know, I mean, how many millions do you need to be safe or to be happy? Um, well, you, better, you, you best ask Jeff Bezos that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, how many, you know, uh, they're getting it together a bit in Starbucks in the States where they're unionizing. I believe in unions. When they're on the right track, I believe in them. They have, they can have a con kind of concrete mentality uh, at their worst, but at their best, they take care of people. I want to see a strengthening of, of unions all over. Do you know, years ago, I remember many Irish people would say, if you want to get a job, you know, the best job you get, you know, you could ever get is, it uh, doesn't matter what you're doing, whether you're putting together beer barrels or whatever, uh, get a job in Guinnesses. You'd be looked after for life. It was an institution. Yeah. But Guinnesses started on 100 quid. Yeah. It's a great story. But what I mean is in that we love <coughs> we we love investing in romanticism and institutions and building up those institutions. 
And while we build up those institutions, we have a tendency as well where there is success, unfair and due and well earned success. Yeah. We have a tendency to pull it down. What's sometimes known as the Irish begrudgery. Yeah, what I was talking about there, you know, yeah. um, begrudgery is a terrible thing. Um, and another thing, we cannot keep on living our lives through other people's eyes. Aren't we taught from a very young age to do that? In that, what I mean by that, that instinctively because uh, Ireland has grown up on a sort of what they proverbially call a traditional nucleus family. Um, daughter wants to <coughs> do and emulate what mom is and son wants to emulate what dad is. And that we tend to follow those paths of tradition. That's only part of the story. What's the other part? Every family has a garbage can. A person who functions for all the garbage in the family. Each family cannot acknowledge or credit these garbage cans because by recognizing, acknowledging and crediting, they can no longer use them. It's like a safety valve. And that's in every family that I've known. There's always been a garbage can. Conscious or unconscious, it doesn't matter. I, I know many of them. I was such a person myself. No, no, I was just going to, it, it was the honest answer. Or the, answer yeah. the honest question I was going to, uh, had you felt that way at home? Yeah, sure. Because um, I was the middle. Mother told me at one stage that I was the, um, I was the son that she really wa I was the one son she really wanted to have. And I'm kind of thinking, my God, how can you say something like that? <laughs> You're basically sticking a, a, a stab in my both my brothers, my older brother, and my younger brother. What kind of what nonsense? And then uh, my, my second thought was, OK, well, if I'm the one you chose to have, why the hell don't you treat me better? And again, you're looked upon as making waves. Stop being, stop being inconvenient. Stop standing up for yourself. We can't, we can't tolerate that. We need our garbage can. <laughs> to, place Sorry, our the garbage things, to place our things we don't want to speak about within. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, it's... Um, but eventually, I mean, you get through this stuff and you work out what's going on and, and you sort it out. Uh, I don't think we ever succeed in totally sorting stuff out. But we can come a long way and it's a process. You know, again, it's the mirror. A work in progress. I'd love to see St. Patrick come back. He missed the nest of them. <laughs> Got to hand over now to uh, John Buckley McQuaid for final thoughts. Oh, and yes, he's going to uh, talk. Actually, yeah, th this was an intriguing. T tell me a little bit about this. This is, this is essentially like a thumbnail memory drive stick. Yeah, exactly. It's shaped like a book and it's wooden. And it's got all the songs from the album and all the videos and all the lyrics. Dear Mr. Taoiseach. Ah, oh, yes, please. Let's finish on this one. <laughs> Give us this day, Lord, our villas in Spain, Lord. Give us our castles with breakfast in bed. Send us a case of expensive champagne, Lord. Give us a place, Lord, to lay down our heads. We are the bowsies, the bullies and blackguards. We are the rulers of all we survey. We are the masters of fabulous flashcards. We're the broadcasters with nothing to say. Dear Mr. Taoiseach, from Cove to Killarney, how is old Ireland's proverbial bliss? 
slather its lips with your blathering and blarney. We'd be delighted to give it a kiss. Dear Mr. Taoiseach, where can we be off to? Following leaders to heaven or hell. People are people from cradle to coffin. Somebody's always got something to sell. What of the babies they left on our doorsteps? What of the innocent girls that they shamed? What of the idols they fearfully worshipped? What of the bones that they buried unnamed? What of the tears they pretend not to notice? What of the orphanage blood in our veins? What of the postcards that nobody posted telling us where we could find the remains? <clears throat> Dear Mr. Taoiseach, from Cove to Killarney, how is old Ireland's proverbial bliss? Slather its lips with your blather and blarney. We'd be delighted to give it a kiss. Dear Mr. Taoiseach, where can we be off to? Following leaders to heaven or hell. People are people from cradle to coffin. Somebody's always got something to sell. Dear Midden Gronya and mighty Finn Ragin, Deirdre and Nisha who took to the hills. Joseph and Grace, they were wed in Kilmainham. Oscar believed that indifference kills. Patrick and Hilda still missing each other. William B. Yeats and a Maud who was gone. Leaving the poet she loved like a brother. Singing the praises of 59 swans. Dear Mr. Taoiseach from Cove to Killarney, how is old Ireland's proverbial bliss? Slather its lips with your blather and blarney. We'd be delighted to give it a kiss. Dear Mr. Taoiseach, where can we be off to? Following leaders to heaven or hell. People are people from cradle to coffin. Somebody's always got something to sell. John Buckley McQuaid, it has been a pleasure to talk Thank you to very you. much for having me, Mick. Uh, a reminder to everybody, the album is This Is Where I Keep My Dreams. Uh, you can find the uh, links uh, wherever you uh, see or listen to this. Um, John, somehow I think in the not too distant future, we'll be talking again maybe about something else. Who knows? That's fine. Yeah, I look forward to that. It's been great talking with you. Yeah, it's it's been a fascinating and intriguing programme. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, Mick. I've enjoyed it and, and uh, I appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. OK, that's it from yeah. us and for this episode.